say amen amen i welcome you to the bread broadcast a weekly bible teaching program from eternal food evangelistic organization a unit of eternal food ministry where we edify we exalt and we challenge believers to the great commission here we also call sinners to salvation through the gospel of our lord jesus christ thank you for joining us Today, we are going to be talking about hindrances to prayer. Hindrances to prayer. And our case study would be uh, ancient Israel in the time of the prophet Ezekiel. And our short reading would be from the New Testament. The Gospel according to St. John, chapter 6. Verse 28, we start at 42. It's quite a bit of a read. John chapter 6, verse 28, we start at 42. Let us pray. Father God, there's none like you. No one else can be like you. You are God all by yourself. We honor you, we praise you, we worship you. Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, I surrender myself to you, blessed Holy Spirit. Through me, O oh Lord, minister to your people. Use this lesson to expose the lies of the enemy concerning our prayer life in the name of Jesus. And through this lesson, let our prayer life be revitalized that we will we'll start praying prayers that receive quick answer from the home office. Thank you, Father God. For in Jesus' name, I will pray. Amen and Amen. Our foundation text is the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 14, verse 3. Ezekiel 14, verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. This was God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. And put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by then? This was when the elders in Israel came to the prophet to ask him to seek the face of God on their behalf as it was the practice in the Old Testament. And God said, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So from this foundation text, the text in the book of Ezekiel, we see a threefold clock and appearing in the wheel of the prayer of God's people. And uh, we need to note, I, I must note that as we go, that these um, three clogs, if you will, they are interwoven, they, they interplay. So um, they are not like separate totally. Now, the first thing that God said based on that foundation text was that these people that were coming to ask uh, the prophet to pray for them, they had a set up star in their hearts. A set up star is a desire. The people of Israel had the idols each worshipped in their homes, yet they still wanted to hear from the God of Israel. They did not come to the prophet so they could be instructed by God. No. They came to see if God would agree with their lifestyle. Have you seen that lately? Huh? People will say, I'm a Christian, and this is the way I serve God. 
And yeah, that's okay. God is okay with it. And I tried to tell them, who is God? You or God? Because God is saying, this is how I want to be worshipped. And you are saying, this is the way you worship God. Uh, I don't think so, you see. When we already have our eyes on something, and we see it, that this thing is good or too good to pass up, or we see it as an opportunity of a lifetime, we've already set ourselves up for prayer pains. Track with me, please. Because we don't know what God's plan will be for our lives in the next few months or in the next few years, you see. Uh, about five, four or five years ago, I was doing something different, even though he's in the ministry, but I wasn't teaching like this, you see. That was where God wanted me at that point in time. And then things changed. There was a time God's plan for me was just to be a stay-at-home mom, looking after my children. And then it God said, okay, now we are moving to another phase of your life, you see. But if I had set my desire on something, and I'm like, oh, this is an opportunity of a lifetime, that will affect me from listening to what God is saying, you see. Unchecked desires can clog our inner eyes and ears, that is our spiritual eyes and ears, from seeing what God is showing us or telling us. Because we will be asking God for an outcome that we want, based on our heart's desire, you see. And now falling into this ditch, oh Lord have mercy. How many times? I don't know, you see. God gives us room to our desires. Don't get that wrong. Don't, don't say, oh, does that mean I, I should act like a robot? No. He has created us to also have our own desires, like, oh, this is what I would love. But if that desire contradicts his plan for our lives, we must change our position to fit God's desire for our lives. Listen up. To hope that God will change his mind <laughs> to fit your fancy, to fit my fancy, is to pray prayers that are dead on arrival. Dead on arrival. Because that desire has become an idol. You see. I, I wish we had the time. Uh, I, I wanted to give some examples, but uh, time would not permit me. But I believe you, you understand what I'm trying to say. So if you like something so much and you are hoping that God will not give you something different, that thing has become an idol. It has become an idol. James chapter 4 verse 3, the epistle of Apostle James, chapter 4 verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. And that doesn't mean that you are, you, you are planning to buy a car or you are planning to, to go on uh, holiday uh, trips and all that. No, your pleasure is your personal, your heart's desire, you see. Your desire, what you really think, this is the best for me. And God is saying, no. When you stick to your gun like that, the Bible says you ask and you do not receive because you, you have it on your own pleasure, your heart's desire. Unbridled desire can easily become a deadly Delilah. We need to say that again and slowly. If you are a Bible student, you will know the story of Delilah. She became the devil's barber. For Samson, by cutting the hair of his glory, you see. Unbridled desires can also do the same thing. Unbridled desire can easily become a deadly 
Delilah. Moving on. The second thing that God said these people had was a filled up heart. Not only did they have a set of star, they also had filled up heart. This is decision. In the time of Ezekiel, Israel had gone into full-blown idol worship of carved images. Now, the prophet Ezekiel was in Babylon, and God was showing him all these things through vision. And he could see what was happening in Jerusalem, you see. They had false prophets prophesying to them that God was pleased with them even though they were worshiping idols. However, every one of these people, listen up, knew about the commandment of God that prohibited the worship of idols and still prohibits it, even today. But because having a physical image worked well for their beliefs, they simply settled for fake prophecies. You see, they knew those prophets were lying. They know. Because they all knew the law that God gave Israel through Moses. That you will not have a graven image. And they had these graven images. And the prophets were saying, oh God is pleased with you. Peace be upon you. Peace be unto you. So they knew they were lying. That the prophets were lying, you see. But they were okay with it anyway. These people already made up their minds. All they were looking for was a divine approval through a prophecy, a vision, or a sign to the situation they already originated. This is called spiritual gambling. Please listen up. The devil likes this. Because many children of God have been led into the ditch of life due to spiritual gambling. I refrain from giving examples here because I, I, I talk to a lot of people, I counsel a lot of people. So there are just too many examples and I, it, it's really a sad situation for believers how the devil uses this, God, give me a sign. And the devil uses that to lead a lot of God's children astray. I've experienced it before in the past, but praise God, I'm delivered, you see. Everyone that genuinely asked God for a sign in the Bible did not create the situation they sought clarification for. They did not. The situation was presented without their influence whatsoever. They only asked God for a sign to be sure if the situation was from God. And God was gracious enough to give them the sign they asked for. For example, Gideon. Gideon was minding his own business, th um, threshing a barley in the wine press. He was minding his own business. And suddenly, an angel appeared to him and said, Oh, that uh, thou man of valor. And he said, Who? And the, the angel said, You. And the angel gave Gideon the message from the Lord. And Gideon said, Okay, this is really from God. I need God to give me this sign. And God was gracious enough to give Gideon that sign before he led Israel to that battle, you see. Gideon didn't come up with that situation. He was just minding his own business. So if you are the one that originated the situation and then you are asking God to give you a sign, you are playing with fire. Because the devil will make sure you see the sign you're looking for and that will lead you astray. In our dispensation, we have the word of God to direct us, to confirm our steps, to be sure if we are on God's path or our own path. For example, you want to go into 
a business partnership with somebody, or you've seen a sister, a brother, that you are thinking maybe you can get married, uh, get engaged and get married. Uh, you already, you, you, you have some thing going on in your mind. Don't go and say, don't say, oh God, show me a sign. Is sister XYZ is my wife that, you... no. If you do that, you setting yourself up for trouble. How do you go about it? Go into the word of God. Okay? What does the Bible say about getting married? For example, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Uh, it says, um, uh, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So that is telling you first the kind of uh, a sister or a brother that you can agree to date to eventually get married to. He or she has to be a believer. You see. So that's your first uh, direction. Then how do you know that this person is indeed a believer? That it's not just because they show up in the home church or at Bible fellowship. How do we know a true believer? The, 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 the Lord Jesus said, I believe in um, the book of Matthew, I believe, uh, that by their fruit you shall know them. Okay, start looking for the fruit. How do you know the fruit? The book of Galatians tells us uh, what we are supposed to look for in the fruit of the Spirit. The Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, peace, joy, faithfulness. Um, there, are, there, are, there are nine of, 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 uh, of those, you see. And you, you start looking for that over a period of time, even as you are praying. With that, step by step, the Lord will guide you and will lead you, okay? And you looking to God to, to lead you to the college you need to go to? What kind of college? The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, you see. That's what the Bible says. So that tells you the kind of college you are to be looking for. Not just because uh, the college has a great name, it's an Ivy League, no. If it's a liberal school where they teach godlessness, you know, the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That means you have to steer clear of that, you see. There are so many colleges, they may not be Christian colleges, but they will not force godless teachings down your throat. They will let you make your decisions, you see. So we have the word of God to guide us. Instead of saying, God, show me, uh, give me a sign. Don't, don't look for that or else you'll find trouble. Let's go to Psalm 119, verse 18. Psalm 119, verse 18. It says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. And your law that the Bible is talking about there is the word of God, you see. So instead of looking to the sky or looking around for somebody wearing red as a sign, uh-uh, open the word of God. In God's economy, a filled up heart is a kill joy dart. In God's economy, a filled up heart is a kill joy dart. Moving on. The third thing that God said uh, was a problem with the people of Judah, people of Israel, in the time of the prophet Ezekiel, was a rigged up path. A rigged up path. This is the vice. Not only they had a, a contradictory desire that contradicted the plan of God for them, not only that, they already decided what they were going to do. They were just looking to God to confirm it looking for a sign and not only that they already put everything in place that will help them on their desire to go on the way they have desired so the rigged up path is device many people will have already put wheels w-h-e-e-l-s under their wheel 
W-I-L-L, you see. And then they will sprinkle some prayers on it and ask God to bless it. Have you done that before? I have. But I learned the hard way, you see. This does not mean that believers should not plan in life. No. We should plan. The Bible encourages us to have plans, you see. However, the wind beneath the sail of our plans should be if the Lord wills. We should be ready to change our plans at a moment's notice if the home office, that is heaven, instructs us differently. There, there was a family, uh, I mean, I, I learned so much from that family, from their affliction. There was a job promotion and bam, they were like, oh, this must be from God because they, they weren't expecting that job promotion and they packed up, sold everything. I mean, they moved. They moved far away. A few weeks down the road, then I, I, saw, I saw that individual back. And I was like, what's going on? They had to come back to the previous place where they were. Because the Holy Spirit made them to realize, listen, you did your own thing. That wasn't my plan for you, you see. And that really shook me. So, if God has a different plan for our lives, we should always remember that. Okay, this is what I plan to do. This is what I'm going to do. But, if only if God wills. Taking practical steps toward our desired outcome and then asking God to show us his plan or asking God to bless it is like putting the cart before the horse. It won't work. It's not going to work. You already put everything in place. You already asked um, that sister to, to marry you and she had already said yes and you said God, oh bless our union. Hey, don't put God, in, don't put God into that because you didn't ask him. Starting out, you see. Acts 16, verse 7 to 8. The book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 7, we stop at 8. After they had come to my Asia, this is Apostle Paul and his team on their second missionary journey. They tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by my Asia, they came down to Troas. Now, you might be thinking, oh, this is just about uh, secular jobs and all that. No, this was a missionary journey. All they were doing was preach the gospel from city to city. Even in that, the Holy Spirit said, do not go into my Asia. And they had to circumvent that city to go to Troas, you see. So don't think only is when you are working as a nurse or a doctor, or a teacher or a mother, stay at home mom. No, God's plan shows up everywhere in the lives of his children, including people working in the vertical jobs like myself, okay? To fit your plan into God is to be blessed. You want to be blessed? Then fit your plan into God's. To try to force God into your plan is to be stressed. Let's say that slowly. To fit your plan into God's is to be blessed. To try to force God into your plan is to be stressed. So what have we done so far? What constitutes entrances to prayer? Number one, set of star. This is a desire that has already won our fantasy and has become the pilot for
for our prayers. Filled up heart. This is asking God to ratify a decision that we already made without his input in the first place. Read up path. This is putting devices in place that will aid us to our desired plans and hoping that God approves it. So, how long have you been asking God for a specific request? Now, I'm talking to God's children, believers, blood washed. You know that your sins have been forgiven in heaven. How long have you been asking God for a specific prayer request? Have you lost hope that God will ever answer? Or you have concluded that God must be too busy for you? Huh? Listen. As a genuine child of God, God is never busy to hear you. Neither does he get any joy from knocking back your prayers. No. God will never Listen up. Answer any prayer in a way that is against his nature, his character, and definitely he will not answer any prayer that is against his purpose for our lives. It's not going to happen. That's God's tough love because he has a panoramic view. We don't. What seems good to us, God is saying, mm, 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 mm. Three months down the road, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work out. You see. Whenever we are not receiving answers to our prayers, the problem always lies within us. As senior pastor in the ministry here, we say the problem is always with us, Sister Josephine. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, what am I missing again? You see. We say the problem is always with us. Maybe God has answered, but it's not the way we expected, you see. Or we are asking God according to our own view. When our prayers align with God's purpose for our lives, we are bound to receive answers because he has promised us so. Now, if you are not a child of God, if you have not been saved, if, if, you, if you don't have a relationship with Christ Jesus, maybe you just go to fellowship, you go to home church, uh, some people they call it church, but we do home church in the China Food Ministry, uh, and um, you, you, you think that that's what makes you a believer. No. You are a believer if you know that your sins have been forgiven and you have the Holy Spirit actively working in your life, directing your life every day. Now, if you don't have that confidence, that means you are not yet saved, okay? But that doesn't mean things cannot change. Things can change. For a pagan, an unbeliever, I'm sorry to say, you have no business asking God for anything except, God, I want to become a child of God. Forgive me my sin. And then God says, let's talk. Okay? You cannot be asking God, God, do this for me. No. Because he only does things for his children. However, God in his omnipotence can answer your prayer. But it's to show you that he is real. Maybe you are looking for God, you know, like, I, I really want to be sure. And if you are genuine, yes, he can do that. And he wants to use that to lead you to receive the Lord Jesus into your heart. That's your point. God is not a Father Christmas. He's not. But he wants to be a father to the mass who turn to him. Okay? Do you want to join the multitude who are already his children? That can happen right here, right now. 
I'm going to say a quick prayer. A link is coming up. Follow that link. We meet you there. Father God, we thank you. Because you're good and your mercy endures forevermore. Thank you because you are a God who hears, the God who answers prayers, the God who sees, the God who is interested in every aspect of our lives. Help us, Lord, to follow after you, not to jump ahead of you, not to lag behind, or to be directed by your Holy Spirit. Help us, O oh Lord, to live a fully surrendered life in this Christian journey. And as many that are going to want to know Jesus' page, Father, I pray that you will meet with them by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. Listen, I will see you next week. Only the Lord Jesus has not split the sky open. Jesus died for us all so we can have life. Come to him and receive life, believe on him and thirst no more. Good News Reporting is all we do, seeing souls safe is our ministry.